as I was saying, you need to know the difference between a terminal and an internal alkyne. A terminal alkyne means nothing more than on one side you have an R group, but terminal means it's at the end of the molecule and on one of the carbons you have a hydrogen. Okay, so that's a terminal alkyne, whereas internal means you've got two R groups, one on each side, okay? And as I was saying also, we're going to talk about both of these, but I'm going to bring up terminal alkynes like a million times in this in this uh, chapter. And as the chapter unfolds, you'll see why. There's a very good reason why I'm going to talk about terminal alkynes a whole bunch. All right. So with all of that in mind, that's a lot of information. Let's just see if we can name a couple of alkynes. Okay. Let's see if we can do that and kind of build up our confidence. And then we'll get into looking at the acidity of terminal alkynes. Okay, the first one here, look, you can see that if I number this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, or if you number it this way, one, two, three, four, five, six, either way, we have some kind of three hexine. Okay, either way, could anybody tell me? What do you think would be the correct way to number this? The way that I have it numbered in red or in blue? Absolutely. Oh, I got a couple of, sorry, I got a couple of different answers here. Actually, yeah. Okay, I see that most people are answering in blue. And you would be, you would be totally correct. The way that I have it done in blue is correct. Why? Because either way you get a three hex sign. So what do you have to do? You got to go to the next rule. So next, we're going to number and name our substituents. If we use the blue numbering, we have a 2-methyl, whereas if I was to do it the other way, then we'd have a 5-methyl. 2 is lower than 5, and therefore, this would be the correct way to do it. So we have 2-methyl, 3-hexine, so 2-methyl, 3-hexine. This is something I don't do a lot of. I usually just kind of guide you through the problems. Could I give you like 30 seconds or... or could anybody give or just type a name in the chat for this compound? Is anybody able to come up with a name for that? I just want to see, and I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. And don't be shy. If it's not right, it's not a big deal. We're just learning. We're trying to master the content, so we're getting started here. Oh, there you go. I got one name. I'll give it a second to see if anybody else comes up with any different name. It has the same thing. Yeah, okay. I got a couple of names here. Yeah, okay. I see that my students are both, both of my students that typed a name in the chat already are, yep, both of you are exactly correct on the parent, aren't you? Right, so what my student said was, look, Mr. Dion, this is a terminal alkyne. I'm going to start with this carbon. So I've got one, two, three, four. This is some kind of one butyne. Absolutely. And then I have two methyl groups here. So I have a three, three dimethyl. So three, oops, I didn't give myself enough space there. Three, three dimethyl, dimethyl one butyne. And there you have it, my friends. Perfect. So just to review, like one thing I want to point out is when you're looking at that chain, let me highlight it in yellow here. You are absolutely correct that the double bond is found on both of those carbons or both of those carbons are part of the, did I say double bond when I meant triple? Both of those carbons are part of the triple bond, but we go with the lowest number. So it's a one butyne, not a two butyne. Two butyne would be this. If you had this, a triple bond like this, this would be two you time. All right, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. If you don't, give me a thumbs down or ask me a question. I would love to answer any questions about alkyne nomenclature. All right, there we go. And of course, I didn't put the alternative names in here. For this one, it would be two methyl, hex, three, ine. There's nothing wrong with that. Or for this one, it would be three, three dimethyl. Dimethyl mute one ine. Either way it is perfectly reasonable, and you have to know those. All right, they're common for a reason. 
Well, let's talk about some acid-base chemistry for a few minutes. So we've covered kind of an introduction to alkynes. We've looked at nomenclature of alkynes. Let's go over and talk about the acidity of alkynes, of terminal alkynes, mind you. It says, recall that a terminal alkyne has a lower pKa. It's more acidic than other hydrocarbons. Now, something that I know that all of you did earlier on when we were back in um, chapter three, the acids and base chapter, I know that you all took the time to memorize some pKa's that I asked you to memorize. And these would all be pKa's that I, I know you all have these memorized. We start with an alkane, like ethane. It's, you know, the weakest of the weakest of the weakest acids. It's got a pKa of 50. That thing doesn't want to lose a proton at all. Then you go up to ethylene. It's, you know, got a little bit of a lower pKa. But check this out. You have a huge difference in pKa between ethylene and acetylene. Acetylene is 19 log units more acidic than ethylene. So that's 10 to the power of 19. That's, that's a big number, okay? So it's much more acidic. Well, why is acetylene so much more acidic than ethylene and ethane? Do you guys remember this old chestnut from chapter four? Do you remember Aereo, A-R-I-O? Could anybody tell me which one of those letters would you use to rationalize? And this is something we did in chapter four. I'm just kind of reviewing it with you. Which one of these letters would be used to rationalize the fact that acetylene is so much more acidic than ethylene and ethane? Would it be atom, resonance, induction, or orbital? Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Tracy. So what Tracy answered was, it's orbital. And Tracy is 100% correct, 100% correct, right? Because if you draw the conjugate base of all these, the negative charge is on the carbon, so you can't use that. It's not resonance. None of these have a resonance structure or resonance contributor. It's not induction. There's no electron withdrawing groups. However, if I highlight all of these carbons in blue, the carbon-hydrogen bonds, are all between the S orbital of the hydrogen, but a carbon with a different hybridization. This carbon is sp3 hybridized, this carbon is sp2 hybridized, and this carbon is sp hybridized. Well, how does that affect acidity? Well, we remember that an S orbital is smaller than a P orbital, so we're gonna to get to that in a second. It says that acetylene can be deprotonated if you have a strong enough base to form the acetylide ion. So acetylene, when it's deprotonated, gives you an acetylide. I'm going to use the word acetylide all the time. Sometimes I'll draw it this way. Sometimes I'm just going to draw it like this. Uh, where's my key? There we go. Sometimes I might draw it like this. Or an even simpler form would just be this. Okay, just that. Okay, all of these that I have here, they all mean the same thing. They're all an acetylide ion. Now, if you have a terminal alkyne, so let me write this out in blue. If you have a terminal alkyne, like this, okay, so this is a alkyne, alkyne. When you deprotonate that with a base, so let's say you take a really strong base, I'll draw it the same way as it is up there. You rip that proton off, that one with a pKa of 25. Now, you don't call this an acetylide, since it's not a, it's not acetylene that's deprotonated, it's an alkyne. So you call this an alkanide, alkanide, okay? And that's a word I need you to know is the alkanide. Sometimes I'm going to talk about acetylides, which is just a two-carbon conjugate base of acetylene. And then alkanides are when we have an R group on one side. So if you take a terminal alkyne and you deprotonate it, you get an alkanide. So alkanide and acetylide, words I'm going to use all the time. So make sure you're fully aware of what... previous slide was the whole idea of Aereo, and my students were definitely on the right track in thinking that, well, we use orbital to explain why acetylene is a stronger uh, or is a, a stronger acid than ethylene or ethane. So let's take a look at those orbitals. And here we have the conjugate bases of ethane, ethylene, and ethyne, or acetylene, all written out here. And you see that the acetylide ion is more stable. Why? Because the lone pair occupies an sp orbital. What do we know about an sp orbital? It's 50% s and it's 50% p. 
sp, whereas if you have an sp2 orbital, it's about 33% s, and it's about 67% p. Then you go to an sp3, which is 25% s, and it's 75% p. Well, what do we know about s orbitals? s orbitals are smaller than p orbitals. So therefore, if you have a hybrid orbital that has more s character, that means that this hybrid orbital, this sp orbital is smaller and it's closer to the nucleus or it keeps those electrons closer to the nucleus. If the electrons produce a negative charge and they're closer to a positively charged nucleus, what does that do? It stabilizes them. Remember, what makes something a good acid is its ability to let its protons leave, right? It's like, it's like a parent that's comfortable with sending their kids to university, you know, they're like, be gone, you know? That's a strong acid, okay? It's okay with leaving the protons because it's stable when they're gone, right? A weak acid is something like this. If, if, the, if the proton leaves, it's like, oh my goodness, I have this negative charge in this giant orbital. It's nowhere near the nucleus. It's not stable. So that's the kind of rationale we want to have. Anyhow, kind of a funny way of putting it, but hopefully that makes some sense to you. So let's talk about the kind of bases you might use to deprotonate a terminal alkyne or acetylene. And it says here that a basis conjugate acids, pKa, has to be greater than 25 in order for it to be able to deprotonate a terminal alkyne. If we look at this, am or this base here, this is called sodium amide. So this is sodium, sodium amide, or we write it as NaNH2. They've just drawn out the entire Lewis structure of the amide ion. And that rips the proton off of the acetylene molecule to give us the acetylide. And then we look at the conjugate acid that's formed. It's ammonia. You recognize that. Well, if we compare the pKa of the acid and the conjugate acid, we see that the equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the acetylide. Why? Because then you have the weaker acid. Remember, the equilibrium will always lie to the side of the weaker acid, not the stronger acid, but the weaker acid. And so this is a good base for deprotonating a terminal alkyne or acetylene, as is shown here. And you might be wondering, well, hold on. I took general chemistry too, and I know that hydroxide, that's a strong base, and you're absolutely correct. Hydroxide is a strong base. However, it's not strong enough to deprotonate a terminal alkyne or acetylene. Check it out. If you compare the pKa of acetylene and the pKa of water, which is the conjugate acid of hydroxide, equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the weaker acid. And so hydroxide is not an effective base at deprotonating an alkyne, an al a terminal alkyne or acetylene. All right, so the next slide is nothing more than a rehash of the whole uh, alkanine thing, which I showed you before. Um, and the whole, uh, and, and now, so now we've got the alkanide and we've got the acetylide thing down. Um, let's talk a little bit more about bases. Okay, let's get into some base country here for a few minutes. Uh, what are the bases? Well, you saw that sodium amide is good. Okay, sodium amide can deprotonate a, a terminal alkyne. It can deprotonate acetylene, but is that the only base available? No, there's a few others as well. Let me show you what they are. There's three that you need to know in this class in organic chemistry too as well. There's no new ones that we introduce in organic chemistry too, so don't worry about that. Let's take a look at what they are. Remember that what I said a couple of slides ago is that in order for a base to be strong enough to rip the proton off of acetylene or a terminal alkyne, the pKa of its conjugate acid has to be greater than 25. Okay, so you can see that all of these acids have a pKa that's greater than that of the terminal alkyne. And therefore, their conjugate bases are going to be strong enough to rip the proton off. So here are the bases we could use. We could use amide, and we just saw that. This is the amide ion. This is a hydride. You remember that from general chemistry. And this is the butyl carbon ion. So we'll just call this Bu like this, and you can just put like a negative charge like that. The counter ion that's usually used with this anion is uh, lithium. So we usually say butyl lithium like that. Okay, so again, it's usually a lithium cation. And that's something that you're going to see as we move forward in the class. Now, remember 
None of these will work. You can't use terbutoxide. You can't use ethoxide. You can't use methoxide. You can't use hydroxide. Why? Because the pKa of their conjugate acids is lower. Okay, they're not lower than 25. They're not strong enough bases to rip the proton off. So these are the ones you need to know. Where's my yellow highlighter? These bases will deprotonate a terminal alkyne. Cool? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. Just the whole, these are the bases that you need to know. And what's kind of funny about these bases is that they come up in section 9.3. And then they come up in section 9.4 as well. And then we take kind of a hi hiatus from those bases or we don't talk about them a ton. And then at the very end of the chapter, they, they come up again. Okay, They sort of come up in the, the last section or the second to last section or something like that. Anywho, there we go. So we covered a whole bunch of cool stuff here. Um, let's see if we can, you know, do another practice problem. It says in each of these cases, Determine if the base is sufficiently strong to deprotonate the terminal alkyne. Well, the first one, we certainly know what it is. It's sodium amide. That will work. So we'll practice writing out the name. This is sodium amide, and that will definitely work. Okay, so what are we going to get? We're going to take the proton off of here. So let's draw the, um, it's not asking us to draw the product, is it? But anyhow, let's do it. We'll land to the free. Anyhow, so we're going to deprotonate that. Then we have our tert butyl group over here. You're going to have the sodium cation here, and then you're also going to form ammonia. All right, just to review, the pKa of this proton, 25. The pKa of the conjugate acid of the base that we use to do the deprotonation is uh, 36. So we'll put here 36, close enough. Anyhow, so the equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the weaker acid. So this will work. I don't know, what are we supposed to write? Yes or something? Anyhow, the next one is sodium hydride. So this is sodium sodium hydride. Will a hydride work? Hydride. Will this work? Yes or no? You can give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Hey, perfect. All my students say yay. And all of my students are right. I like that. So let's draw the product just for fun, get some practice. So we end up with the sodium cation of the conjugate base of our terminal alkyne. And then we also produce hydrogen gas. Hydrogen gas is a pKa of 35. So it's around 35. And of course, this is, has a pKa of 25. So that will totally work. And what about terbutoxide? Who can give me a yay or a nay? Anybody for terbutoxide? Will that work? Oh, exactly. All of my students are perfectly correct. Let's just put here, we'll put a big X over it. No. Okay. Why is that? Because the pKa of the terminal alkyne is 25, but the pKa of terbutanol, if we go back to that table, the pKa of terbutanol is 18. I mean, that's really, really low. So let's scribble that in here. This has got a pKa equal to. Um, uh, what did I say it was? Uh, sorry, it's 18. I, I had some, a number scribbled in my notes. I said, that's not right. And so the pK is 18. And so the equilibrium is going to lie to the side of the weaker S. So the equilibrium would lie to this side. So the answer is a big old no, won't work. Wrong reagent. There we go. So we've covered the first three sections. We talked about a little bit of introduction, some nomenclature some acidity. And I think that, you know, we're moving along here in the class today. I think that this is a good place to start talking about preparation of alkynes before we take a break. Now that we've learned how to name alkynes, we've discussed their acidity. Now we're going to talk about how would you make an alkyne? If you had to make one, how would you make an alkyne? And probably one of the most commonly used ways to make an alkyne is from a dihalide. Now, I told you before we started the lecture today that I would refer back to chapter eight quite a bit. And this slide is no exception to that. So you can see that back in chapter eight, we talked about the E2 reaction. Remember that if you take a strong base, so I'll just write base and I'll put negative charge here on it. 
A strong base can do an E2 reaction where it abstracts a proton, forms the double bond, and we lose the leaving group like this. This is an E2 reaction with an alkyl halide. Well, if you have an al alkyl dihalide, two halogens, whether they're geminal or vicinal, and these are geminal because they're on the same carbon, Gemini, like twins, we can do a double elimination to form a terminal alkyne. And the mechanism is exactly what you would imagine. It's shown here. The first reaction is an E2, just like I just drew. Okay, the base comes, removes the proton, we form the double bond, and we lose bromine. Then we end up with an alkene. We do the same thing again. Oh, where am I here? Go. Oops. We do the same thing again. We do another deprotonation and we make our alkyne. Again, it will work with a geminal dihalide. That's where both halogens are on the same carbon. And it will also work with a vicinal dihalide. That's when the bromines or the your diet, your um, your halogens are on adjacent carbons. Okay, either way, it's going to work, and the mechanism is identical in either case, whether you're starting with a geminal dihalide or a vicinal dihalide. So there you go. It's a double E2 mechanism. I expect you to know this mechanism, so I'll put a you know we'll say no, this mechanism mechanism. Make sure you know that mechanism. And let's talk about this a little more. Now, what if we have, instead of producing an, in, um, an internal alkyne, what if we produce a terminal alkyne? Check this out. It says excess equivalents of sodium hydride can be used to shift the equilibrium towards the elimination product. Check this out. If you have a geminal dihalide, that after deprotonation and after the two E2, so this is two times E2, okay? After that, if you end up with a terminal alkyne, so again, this is a terminal, terminal alkyne. Well, we know that if you have excess of this, so excess, another equivalent of the sodium amide is gonna come in. So you could write out the NH2 minus like this. It's gonna rip this proton off to make the alkanine. And that is actually the driving force for this reaction is the production of that alkanide. So you might be wondering, well, that's not very useful. What am I gonna do with an alkanide ion? You know, just sitting there. Well, we're gonna find out what you can do with them in a, little, in a little bit. But if you wanna isolate the terminal alkyne, you have to treat it with water. So the first step is to use excess sodium amide. And then the second step is to put in water and that serves as a proton donor so that you end up um, end up uh, you know, protonating to give the terminal alkyne. So let's review here. It says overall, a terminal alkyne is prepared by treating the dihalide with excess sodium amide. So let's review. You've got a geminal dihalide. What we're going to do are two E2 reactions, successive E2 reactions. So the first equivalent of amide, and I'm going to try to draw, or I'm going to draw a little bit of a shorthand mechanism here going to form a double bond and lose our bromine. So let's draw what we get from that. We still have this bromine. We still have this hydrogen. We have one, two, three carbons. So that's the first E2. Then we do a second E2 with a second equivalent of amide. Remember, we've got excess. So we draw this. And what's going to happen is we're going to end up ripping off this proton, forming a triple bond and losing the bromine like that. Keep in mind that there is a proton here. I'm leaving it out, but there is a proton here. Okay, so I guess I'll I guess I just put it in. Anyhow, so now we end up with the triple bond. Okay, and we still have that blue proton hanging on the end. And you might think, well, this is the same as this. It's the product. We're done. It is the same as that, but we're not done. Okay, we need to replace that blue proton because it's going to get ripped off by a third equivalent of the sodium amide. Remember, we have excess, so it's going to rip that proton off, and I actually end up with the alkanide. This. So there we go. I end up with the alkanide. So the last step is to treat it with water. So we put some water in the flask. This is a pretty cheap reagent, some water. 
So we end up ripping a proton off of this, and now you have, oops, where's my black pen? Now you've replaced it with a proton from the water molecule. So make sure you could draw this mechanism. No, this mechanism. All right, make sure you know that mechanism. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that mechanism, and if you're like, you know what, I think I could draw that. I might need to practice it, but I think I could do that. All right, and as always, if you have a question about it, don't hesitate to, to stop me and say, Mr. Dion, I'm not quite sure. And if you think you got it now and you don't have it later on tonight, just email me and say, Mr. Dion, I was trying this problem and I can't figure it out. There's no problem. I'll take a look at it with you and we'll see if we can figure it out. Let's try a practice problem here. Not meant to be a, a mind boggler here. It just says for each of the following transformations, predict the product and draw a mechanism for its formation. We're starting out with a geminal dihalide in the first one. We have no beta protons here, but we have three beta protons here, so we can rip those off. Let's start by drawing one of these. I'm probably going to run out of space for the second one, but let's just give it the old college try. I'll just squeeze in the first step here. So we're going to take this and we're going to rip off this proton, make the double bond, lose a bromine. That's going to give us a double bond like that. Oops, that's not very pretty. That's going to give us a double bond like this. We still have this bromine. We still have these two hydrogens. So now a second equivalent of sodium amide is going to come along. Here's our amide ion. It's going to come. It's going to rip off another proton. We lose the bromine. Now we end up with the triple bond. We have this go we still have a red proton on there so we're going to rip that off with another equivalent of our base and if you're thinking hey this is pretty similar to what you just drew on the last slide the answer is absolutely it is absolutely so now we end up with the alkanide so here is our alkanide so we did three successive proton transfers and now we do another one so uh, i'm kind of running out of space here let me just uh i'll put it down here now we treat with water in the second step. We put some water, and that is definitely going to protonate the terminal alkyne like this. And now we have our proton here, and we have our alkyne, just like that. The next reaction is actually going to give you the exact same product. You're still going to end up with, with this compound, okay? I'm not going to do this one. What I'm going to do is say, Make sure you try this one as a practice, okay? Make sure you try that one as a practice. One other thing I want to point out before we move on. Um, let's see here. Um, is there's a question in the book. Oh, I don't have my book in the right place. Here it is. I think it's question 9.8. So everybody who's in lecture with me right now or watching this video, I also want you all to try Question, question 9.8. Okay, I'm going to put a big old star by it. Okay, do this question. It talks about how you can take an internal alkyne that's formed from a double E2 and how you can get a terminal alkanide from that. So I will, I'm not going to go over it with you right now. I want you all to take a look at that and be aware of that. It's very rare for me to say, hey, I want you to check this out on your own but this is one of the few things i ask you to kind of check out on your own well i think this is a good place to take a break because after this section preparation of alkynes now that we've learned how to make an alkyne the next few sections are where we're starting with an alkyne and we're going to do something with it so these will be new reactions for us However, you can see right away that, hey, look at this catalytic hydrogenation. I remember doing that. And you'd be absolutely correct. We talked a whole lot about if you were to take something like trans 2 butene like this, okay, in chapter eight, we said if you treat this with hydrogen and palladium or platinum or nickel, you'll get butene. Well, we see that something similar happens with an alkyne like 2 butyne, and we're going to get into that in detail after our break.